Hey everyone, I'm uh, very excited to be speaking here uh, today with uh, Brandon, aka the Unsilent Minority, uh, who has started an internet campaign called uh, uh, Walk Away. That is a hashtag Walk Away. So, uh, why don't you tell us about yourself and uh, what Walk Away is, and and how what inspired you to start this? Wow. Well, um, all right. So, uh, my name is Brandon. I live in New York City. Um, I'm a lifelong, I was a lifelong, uh, liberal. I've always voted Democrat and, uh, essentially I had, uh, what's commonly referred to as a red pill experience in 2017. Uh, there were a lot of events that sort of led up to that, but the, the real catalyst happened after the election of Donald Trump and, um, some of the events that happened subsequent to that, which really, really opened my eyes to just how dishonest the media is and um, how the media will twist and sort of contort events that happen to create a narrative. And once I, my eyes were open to that, then there was sort of no unseeing that again. And I began, uh, we can get further, I mean, you're free to ask me any questions. I, I, I'm just kind of giving you the general outline right now. So it's okay. Um, so after that happened, I, you know, then I started kind of going to friends of mine and asking questions and saying, hey, what do you think about this? And nobody was really open and willing to receive that. And in fact, I was often met with a great deal of hostility or, um, you know, contempt for even asking questions. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's, it really, in retrospect, I don't think at the time I realized it as much, but I can really see clearly now in retrospect how much that sort of rage narrative of the left actually means to them. I mean, and I felt it too. I mean, I can't totally let myself off the hook, but it's like, they want to hate him. Like they want to be angry. And so, you know, a lot of people on the left do not want to be confronted with some piece of information that's like, you know, maybe things aren't as bad as they seem. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, maybe, you know, we're, maybe, maybe we're safer than we think. Maybe things are okay. They don't want to know that. Um, so I started thinking, well, that's really strange. Um, and once I started to um, get sort of, you know, this pushback from people, then it was, uh, I, I realized that I, I, I was going to have to kind of dig for my own answers. So at that point, I started, I just took to, to the internet and social media. And every night I would get into bed and I would just read articles or research YouTube videos. And, and you know how YouTube is. It's like you watch something and then they suggest other videos. And then the next thing you know, you're like deep in a, a rabbit hole, uh, far from where you started. <laughs> far, far from where you started. But it was really, really helpful because honestly, if not for that rabbit hole, uh, you know, I don't know that I would have had my eyes as open as they were because, you know, I started out just watching videos about the media, you know, like, and particularly how it, the, the media pertained to Trump's election. And I kind of was dialing back, you know, the, you know, uh, Trump calls all Mexicans rapists. Well, even at the time that that happened, and I was, you know, vehemently anti-Trump, um, I remember thinking kind of, that's not exactly what he said, you know, but I, you know, just like I just described, I was kind of, you know, a part of that whole rage narrative too. Yeah. I was just as happy to say, yeah, it's not quite what he said, but we hate him, so let's just go along with it, you know? But I started kind of dialing back and looking in, and then not just looking at those isolated moments, but watching the entirety of the speech and like everything that he was saying. And, and, and then, I, you know, it's like that would lead me to a video that would be a, a video like uh, of black people saying that they were at a Trump rally and that the camera intentionally cut them out of the shot. Yes. Y you know, and I was like, what? Because all we had been told over and over again was that, you know, only white people went to these rallies and that when black people showed up at the rallies, you know, they were met with violence. Yeah, they were attacked and kicked out and stuff. And, you know, you can find these videos of these black people who are like, no, nope, they just saw us and they moved the camera. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's mind blowing. But I why don't you ask me some questions? Cause I feel like I'm kind of just- well, you still haven't told us about walk away. I sure haven't. That's true. All right. So as I became more and more red pilled and as I, you know, I started to do more research, I started to discover for myself. Okay. So I'll, I'll pick up there. 
I was watching, you know, videos and these videos would lead me then to conservative speakers. And oftentimes these were conservative speakers that some of them I didn't know at all. Um, like I didn't really know Ben Shapiro. I didn't really know Dave Rubin. I didn't know, you know, some of the ones who are maybe, well, no, Ben Shapiro is a big deal now, but. Well, uh, Dave Rubin is not like. As mainstream. Probably, the, the, thing, the good thing about Dave Rubin is I certainly don't agree. I think a lot of people don't agree with everything he says, but he's willing to have a discussion with people who are not necessarily on his ideological side of the fence, which yeah. is almost more valuable than just a pure conservative speaker, you know. And he has just such a, like a sweet, delicate, you know, way about him that he's not one of these like, kind of like uh, aggressive conservatives who, you know, he'll, he's yeah. very conversational and very approachable, I think. Um, but through watching them, I started to really listen to their debate points and their talking points and what they were actually saying. And, and then I got, then I got sucked into another hole of just watching debates, like for weeks and weeks and weeks, you know, my absolute favorite. So this is so amazing because I used to hate Tucker Carlson. Oh my God, I used to want to punch him in the face and that's bow tie, I just wanted to punch him. You know, he doesn't wear the bow tie anymore, which I think is a good move. But, uh, you know, now all of a sudden I was watching these Tucker Carlson clips. There's a great visual expression, just the look of amusement on his face is, is always yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. But I would watch um, now, or, you know, then I, I started watching it and I started seeing just how much more logical he is. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, okay, and th that in itself was amazing because, you know, if you have somebody on the left, let's just say uh, Rachel Maddow or uh, any of them, you know, like Anderson Cooper, whoever, I feel like when they debate somebody on the right or, you know, they come out with one of their ridiculous narratives about some, you know, the sky is falling episode that's happened and then they'll go and they'll find some person in a trailer park with two teeth you know and uh you know who doesn't even look human and they'll be like well we're talking to a typical trump supporter yeah. tonight but you know whereas someone like tucker carlson will actually have phds lawyers uh politicians you know intelligent people on the left he'll have on his show and he'll debate them and he always makes them look foolish why? Because the liberal ideology is foolish. I mean, yeah. there, there, there are very few instances in which the liberal ideology is like, hmm, that actually is a that's, a, that's a more solid plan. I mean, and I was beginning to see this. I was like, wow, you know, I used to be so turned off just by looking at this man's face. But now that I'm like actually listening to the words that he's saying, this makes yeah. so much more sense. And this is just such a better plan. So... I wanted to start speaking out about that. And I wanted to like, I wanted to talk specifically to people in my own community uh, for anybody who's been living under a rock, I'm gay. So uh, the gay community and uh, because you know, gay people were, we fall into that democratic party trap where we feel like we have to vote Democrat. We have to be um, liberals. And we get these messages all the time from, you know, the, the gay powers that be and the left-wing politicians and the left-wing media. You know, and when I say the gay powers that be, I'm talking about human rights campaign. I'm talking about GLAAD, uh, the gay and lesbian anti-defamation. Uh, you know, these are sort of the representatives of our community and they are constantly telling us that we are in danger. They're constantly telling us that uh, the, we're not, we have no place on the right that, you know, and I think that there was a time that that was true, or at least there was a lot more truth to that. So I don't want to come on here and mislead people and be like, you know, things have always been great on the right for, for gay people. You know, I, I don't, if we were living, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think I'd be sitting here today just, you know, having this viewpoint with you. But the fact of the matter is it's 2018, the world has changed, the world has moved on. Uh, Republicanism is not what it used to be. The right is not what it used to be. And I think that they're, they have a much more solid plan, uh, you know, a nationalist plan, a, a plan of uh, a sovereign country and, and uh, closed borders. These are things that are actually going to keep gay people safe. These are things that are actually going to help uh, lower income black people and lower income Hispanic people rise up, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it, minorities are better off in this day and age to be voting on the right. That's where we should be. And so I wanted to speak out about this and I wanted to kind of just break down this wall that exists right now, you know, and 
it's not an easy wall to break down because there, you know, there's a lot, you're, you're, you're going up against a lot of very loud and very strong forces who do not want to lose their voting base. You know, they do not want people to change and they don't want people to know that they're not in danger anymore. They don't want people to know that their lives could be better if they switched over to the other side. And that does not sit well with me. So I decided to do something about it. And I created a video, uh, which I called the video Walk Away. And my intention initially was to just simply do this video. I mean, to be honest with you, I was jogging one day because I'm a runner and I sort of, that's when I really have my time, you know, to sort of meditate and be in my own head. And a lot of my ideas come to me and I was running one day and the script just started to kind of write itself. Yeah. I was kind of just running and I, something sparked in my mind that said one, once upon a time I was a liberal and then I, it just started kind of writing itself. So I got home and I sat down and I wrote that whole thing in about 40 minutes. And, um, and at first it was going to be just sort of like a blog entry. You know, I just thought, well, not that I have a blog, <laughs> but I thought um, I'll just put it as like, you know, a Facebook post or something, you know, because I think it's, it's strong. You know, I, I think it's good. And I read it over and I thought, I was like, I think this deserves more than just to be a Facebook post. And I read it to a couple of friends of mine and they were like, no, people need to hear that, you know, and, and they need to hear it spoken. So I thought, okay, I'll make it a- support in your real life. Yes. Did you say, so I have support in my real life? Well, that came later. Yes. So I now at this point do no gay conservatives. That happened a while though. I mean, once I had my red pill moment, there was the majority of 2017, I lost um, a good amount of my friends. Um, And so uh, 2017 was a very lonely year, year for me. It really wasn't until probably around October of last year. Wait, is that even true? No, that's not even true. Um, I think it was this year, probably around January, excuse me, of this year, that I made my first conservative gay friend. Um, I found him on Facebook and I was so ecstatic because uh, I had written one of just, you know, some comment um, that was basically, it wasn't even like, I love Trump. It was just like, <laughs> you know, things aren't as bad as they seem. And usually, you know, by this point, I had gotten used to people. Can, can, can I just also say to, to the viewers, and obviously, I think a lot of my, my own audience uh, uh, slants right word. I know that uh, not to be uniformly true. Uh, this is not a, a pro-Trump party we are having here. Yes, it is. <laughs> I, I, I think it's more talking about the evils of, of what the modern Democratic Party has become. Yes, well, sure, while, while also acknowledging that President Trump is the greatest thing that ever happened to America. <laughs> um, all right, but moving on. <laughs> I, I'm speaking only for myself. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, so I posted something on Facebook and um, I had gotten kind of used to either people ignoring my posts altogether or you know, a couple people coming on and being like, You've obviously, you know, are on drugs or something's wrong with you, whatever. I mean, I was just sort of used to that being the red pill, yeah. But all of a sudden somebody liked my post. And I was like, wow, that hasn't happened in a long time. So I took a look at who it was, and it was this guy named Michael, who I didn't know in real life, but um I knew that we'd been friends on Facebook, so I was like, well, that's odd. Maybe he likes my post by mistake. <laughs> so I clicked on his Facebook profile and I kind of fished through and there was a picture of him in a Make America Great Again hat and a picture of him with his arm around Tucker Carlson. And I was like, and I could also, I mean, it was clear that he was gay because he was like, has a boyfriend in his pictures. And so I wrote to him and I was like, are you, are you a Trump supporter? And he was like, yeah. And I said, are you gay? And I, he said, yeah. And I was like, we have to meet for coffee. So, um, so we got together and we had coffee and that was my first gay conservative friend that I made here in New York. And then through him, I've sort of developed a, a network of other gay conservative friends in New York. And um, yeah, so I, I do have some support. And so it was some of these guys that I read the, the script to and, and they said, you know, this, this needs to be heard. So I decided to do a video and uh, I was very, very nervous about it because initially it was just going to be the video. I, I hadn't really in my mind uh, envisioned a campaign uh, behind it, but I was determined at that point that this was something, this was going to be like my coming out and I was going to come out in a big way. Uh, I was going to really, really tell my truth and make a really, really kind of solid, cool video to 
to, to come out with and tell that truth. And then I thought to myself, sort of as I was in the, the, the production stages of putting it together, I thought, um, you know, there are other people like me. We all know that. There are other people who are fed up with the left or have been red-pilled. And I feel like this video is going to be really good. And I feel like this video is going to be really strong. And maybe, maybe we can use this as a starting point to encourage other people to tell their stories and make their video, you know, I, not necessarily gay people, just just people of any demographic that the right. demographic right. That traditionally cater to. Yeah, right. Although, if I were being perfectly honest, I I, I think when I first had the idea, it, I probably was just thinking other yeah. gay people, and and also to be perfectly honest. I probably was doing it as a little bit of self-protection because I thought, well, if I'm going to literally throw myself in the middle of a highway with, you know, speeding buses coming at me, maybe it would be nice to have a couple other people beside me, you know? And so that's sort of like, that was sort of the starting point. But then I started, you know, we're seeing right now this great awakening that's happening specifically in the black community. And, and thank God for all these really awesome amazing black conservatives who are coming out and speaking up now and telling black people, look, you have choices. You don't have to just do this because this is what is expected of you. You don't have to vote this way if that's not really what you feel is in your best interest. And it's not in your best interest. And so I started thinking, you know, we can open this up because there are people of all different types of and demographics who are you know, under this sort of victim narrative of the left. They're, they're they're living under this constant belief that they are victims, mm -hmm. that they cannot succeed. This is, you know, which is, this is being perpetuated from the top down and that they have no other choices or alternatives because the people on the right will not accept them and hate them and don't want them there. And I have not found that to be true in my experience. So yeah, I thought, you know, let's open this up. Well, I created the video and then I decided, so I had already said in my video, in the script that I had written, walk away. And I thought, that's it. That, that's, that's the, um, that's sort of the catchphrase, you know what I mean? Or th that's the selling point, I think, is that we need people to walk away. That's what it is. And so through that, I decided, okay, this is gonna be a walk away movement. Now, the final step of this, which has, I mean, it's all exciting. Honestly, it's all exciting and it's all beautiful. But I think the part that maybe I didn't anticipate being quite as exciting as it has been and ha hadn't anticipated being quite as beautiful as it's been is I also made a decision that rather than just have this be people on the left who are walking away or who want to walk away or who have walked away, I thought to myself, okay, this is a really amazing opportunity for the people on the right who for so long have been the silent majority, mm -hmm. who, who for so long have kind of sat there passively allowing the narrative of who they are to be shaped by the left. You know, the, the left is telling people constantly, barking into their megaphone, telling people these people are racist, these people are bigots, these people are homophobic, they're xenophobic, uh, they hate women, they, you name it. Yeah. And, and that has not been my experience since I have changed. And so I thought to myself, what if not only do we give the opportunity for people on the left to make their own videos about why they're walking away, but if I encourage people on the right to create their own videos using their own voice, telling their own stories, first of all, telling who are you? Like, who really are you? What does it mean to be a conservative? What are your core values? Everybody thinks you're a racist. Everybody thinks you're a bigot. Tell us why that's not true. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us what is true. What, why are you a conservative? If you're not a bad person, and I know you're not, then tell us all the things that you are and tell us why because of those good qualities, you are a conservative. And also make it clear to the people on the left that there's a place at the table for gay people, for black people, for Hispanic people, for all these disenfranchised people on the left that the left keeps telling is, you know, that they're victims and that they, they will not belong on the right. Tell them that they do belong over here and that there's a seat at the table for them and that they're wanted. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's funny. Well, it's kind of it's kind of uh, perversely funny when, when you see like these these uh, leftist advocates 
And it's like they they go like completely a uh, uh, like brainwashed Manchurian candidate, and they just have this kind of litany of accusations for Donald Trump, and they're like, you know, he is a racist, sexist, transphobic, xenophobic, and they just have this whole litany of accusations. Mm -hmm. What what is the evidence for any of these? What give me something Donald Trump has ever said about transsexuals that you could contort into uh, transphobia? But they just accept it as fact because uh that is what they have been told by these demagogues and uh what what i, I think you'll find uh with a lot of these advocacy groups i mean you're talking about like in your case it's like glad or something is that they get the most paranoid members and, and put them to the top of the leadership because these are just people who need to make themselves necessary yes they need to perpetuate their own existence so you're not going to do that by telling people that they're not in danger you do that by saying no you, you are you are an imminent danger uh you need to pledge your allegiance to us we will protect you i call it the oppression industry yes yes it's the oppression industry that's what i call it yeah because it's um they are selling oppression and it is there and it, and if there's not enough oppression to go around around they're out of a job Yes. So they need to make sure constantly that you feel at all times like you're unsafe. Yes. I think I think uh, uh, the Democratic Party as a whole is is basically uh, I, I think there was at one point I think you did probably have to go. Uh, I, I think there was at one point I think you did probably have to go back to like the JFK days or something where they did make an effort to, to put forward the image that they were actually out there batting uh, for the working man. Uh, uh, that Democratic Party doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, they, they don't really uh, give a crap about about the working class anymore. Uh, they are interested in their own self perpetuation. They're interested in, their, in these kind of globalist aims, and yeah. they have these weird like uh, obsessions with like you know promoting abortion. And it's just like it's, that's like the only thing they'll truly go to bat for. Uh, right. Yeah, I, I, I mean. I'm not a fan of, of a single party system, but the modern Democratic Party uh, needs to be destroyed. Uh, agreed. It's evil. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I mean, what we're seeing now, particularly Fonda, uh, you know, these like now legions of people who are uh, doxing ICE agents, uh, standing outside of uh, politicians houses and screaming at them and threatening them, kicking them out of restaurants. I mean, they never respond with arguments. They only respond with rage. Yes, absolutely. Well, and, and I feel like I was, I was running again today and I was, I was thinking about this very thing that we're talking about. You know, it's like, I feel like they have had their feelings validated uh, without exception for so long that they've, they've gotten to a point that they think that their feelings are infallible. You know, and, and we hear all the time, you know, that, you know, conservatives care about facts and liberals care about feelings. Sure, okay, that's, and, which I believe is true too, but we're at, a, we're at an even more extreme level than that now. We're at a level now where it's not even a matter of facts versus feelings. This is a matter of people who have never ever been told that they need to keep their feelings in check and that the feeling that the, the emotions and the paranoia and the complete uh, lack of being grounded in reality has just risen and risen and risen and the media keeps fueling it and fueling it and fueling it and now people feel I mean the best word I can come come up with is entitled they feel so entitled at this at this point to do whatever they want to do based entirely off of what they feel they yes. want to do. And I don't think that they feel like there are any boundaries anymore. I think they feel like I feel upset. And because I feel upset, I am going to do whatever I want to you. And, and it doesn't even matter if you can, I mean, if you can get, provide them with a rational explanation of for why what they're feeling is erroneous. You can say, look, I get that you're upset. I, I can clearly see you're upset. But let's, <laughs> let's talk about it because the thing that you're upset about is actually kind of not true. We're, the Trump administration is not putting brown children in cages. Okay, that's, that's not a real thing that's happening. So it's like, why don't we just talk about it so you don't have to be upset? But like I was saying earlier, I mean, they're at such a level now 
where they want to be angry, they want to be upset. And there's this, I mean, it's like an addiction. It's yeah. really like an addiction. Uh, I, I hate to say it, they just seem kind of dumb because the Democrats are in really bad shape uh, going into November. Uh, they, they were in bad shape before, but now that they have these demographics, uh, whether it's LGBT or blacks, they're all falling away. Things are looking worse and worse and worse with <laughs> with North Korea and the economy and every, everything's going along. Uh, the Democrats or, or, or people who are allied with, with the left are, are – they're – doubling down on what's already not worked and they're tripling down and they're quadrupling down with let's just ramp up the outrage yeah that's oh, that's that not served you well but they're like quadrupling down on outrage like outrage is going to save them at this point but you uh, you know i think the reason why they're doing that is okay because if you really if you apply logic here which is something that you know they don't do but it's like if you just apply logic for a second you would think to yourself okay if, if they had a, if they had an ounce of self-awareness and they could say to themselves, look, we tried like pushing this narrative thing and it kind of backfired. Let's back off that narrative and take a different tack. Yeah. Right. You would think, right. But the fact that they are, as you say, kind of doubling down at this point indicates to me that there is, they're not even aware at this point that I think that they believe what they're saying to a certain degree. And I think that the reason why they're doubling down to a certain extent is that they, they've, they've started believing, as, as they say, they've started believing their own press releases. And then now it's like they're trying to somehow, they think they're gonna shake Trump supporters awake. You know what I mean? I, I think that they think that's what's good. I think that they think, my God, you know, we have a Nazi in the White House and he surrounded himself with a staff of white supremacists and, and it's all just, you know, KKK and neo-Nazis and they're putting little brown kids in cages. And it's like, if we just, if we just talk louder, if we just keep saying it and talk louder, we'll just shake these Trump supporters awake and get them to see that we're in the middle of Nazi Germany, 1935. Meanwhile, we're all over here going, are you guys kidding? Are you, are you, are you kidding, right? You know, it's, it's, I always say it's like this big Scooby-Doo reveal moment, you know, at the end of Scooby-Doo when they pull the hat off or they pull the bag off the head and it's like, well, yeah, of course. but it's like the big Scooby-Doo reveal moment in this whole thing is that these super educated, super elite, you know, arrogant people who think that they're so much better than everybody else. The big reveal is they are the dumbest people in the world. Yes, yes. Because and, and, and the big the big reveal when the bag comes off the head is that that guy in middle America who didn't go to college, who, you know, drives a tractor all day for his job and comes home to, to you know, his modest house went off. He's smarter than you. Yeah. 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 No, I, I love the, the Scooby-Doo analogy because uh, we talked on the phone before and he, met, he mentioned the, the Scooby-Doo analogy. But uh, I was already thinking that because the whole part of the nemesis in every Scooby-Doo episode was like the greedy developer who, who <laughs> wanted to scare people off his land to protect his own greedy interests. <laughs> it was haunted. And that reminds me exactly of the scaremongering yeah. that is going on on the left because they are completely self-interested, but they're going to scaremonger you in, into doing what they want you to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So you also talk about something where, uh, uh, like, the, the uh, uh, anti-red state, anti-flyover state uh, chauvinism, basically, where, where they basically say, oh, every, everyone who lives in Kansas is dumb, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, I, I, I think, like, yeah, you, if it's true, like maybe people who live in, like, a little Kentucky town or something are insular in one way. I think uh, people who live in New York City and Los Angeles are can be insular in their own ways. And I think, like, what happened with you is you guys are using the internet to see outside of that bubble. Yes. So, yes. But there's also something to be said for, um, you know, it really does start with the liberal media, but then it's like, this may be hard for some people to understand. And, and it, again, it comes back to um, snobbery and elitism. But when you're a person, who lives in a fabulous city like New York City, and you have a closet full of fabulous clothes, and you dine at the most wonderful restaurants, 
and you have a petite, petite foie gras for an appetizer and you drink Barolo with your steak and you read a lot of books and you attend the opera and the theater, it is unfathomable to you that somebody else in the middle of the country who is less educated than you are, makes less money than you do, and you know dines on cheeseburgers and beer could possibly know more than you know. They can't, they can't even fathom it. So it's, this becomes a circle, uh, you know, where everybody, it's like that telephone game where everyone's just whispering the same crap to each other over and over and over again. And they don't even want to hear what the people in the middle of the country say because they've already decided they're very, very stupid. Yeah. But again, as we just established, I mean, as that's, that's the big reveal at the end of the book is that the people in the middle of the country were right all along. Yes, uh, and it's also very ironic. The people who make such noise about about going to bat for for the working class and the lower class are really the people who have absolutely nothing but contempt for them. Complete contempt. Yes. Yeah. And for their values. It's like, yeah, you you're entitled to other people's money, but you're not entitled to to have your own values. You're not entitled to have your own beliefs because we we are the ones who are uniquely qualified yes. to, to to form value judgments. Yeah. Well, that's why that's why I think that everything got so bad uh, with Obama in office because, you know, people were really suffering. Now, see, I didn't realize this, and I feel to this day I feel a lot of regret and it, remorse. I guess is the right word because I was very judgmental of the people in the in the middle of the country because I went along. You know, with I was one of those people that I was just describing where it's you know that the circle of conversation where we don't even listen to them. We talk about them, but we don't really listen to them. And you know, a lot of these people, their 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 businesses, their communities, their their towns were very negatively impacted by you know the regulations and the huge influx of illegal immigration, all these things that happened under Obama. Now these people, many of them who don't have a bad bone in their body, just you know if they open their mouths to say, hey, this this is not really working well for us. Things are not going. They were met instantly with, you're just upset because there's a black man in the office. Yes. You're just upset because the president's black. And it's like, we, I say we because I was a part of it at the time. Uh, and I'm not now, let me be clear. But we, the, clear. we at that time pushed these people into a corner where they could not win. I mean, like they couldn't even have a voice because if they simply tried to talk, we just said you're a racist. Yes. And so meanwhile, their lives and their communities and their towns are falling apart and we won't even allow them to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's disgusting. The, the irony is that, is that uh, uh, the Democratic Party is going to kill themselves with black voters over this whole immigration thing. Yes. Over the whole the whole pretense that we are the ones who are not racist, that is what is going to kill uh, uh, their alliance with the African American community. Because because when the when the uh, illegal immigrants come in, they are not moving into uh, Nancy Pelosi's neighborhood. No. <laughs> and they're not. They're certainly not moving into uh, uh, Maxine Waters' neighborhood too, because she's you know in her four million dollar mansion, which isn't even in her district. Yeah. So. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And I mean, and doesn't that just go to show you, again, I use this word arrogance. I mean, they are, they- well, like they, When Walmart gave the uh, $1,000 bonuses to their employees, and I think Nancy Pelosi was like, that's an insult. You know, yeah, that, that's crumbs, crumbs, yeah, crumbs. Well, but it's, it, you know, it's that word again, arrogance, because they just, they take for granted that they've got that vote. I mean, that's that in itself should just, piss black people off to the point where they're like, really? I mean, there's just, there's such an assumption at this point. I mean, they're almost just like, we don't even need to talk to them anymore. They're going to vote for us. Don't worry about it. Let's just bring in a bunch of illegal immigrants. Uh, we'll get, you know, we'll, we'll naturalize them, you know, quickly. We'll get, you know, make sure that they can get an ID and get out and vote. That's the plan. You know, they do not care that when that happens, the people who are going to be affected are the lower income of black community, the lower impact or the lower income uh, Hispanic community, and of course the lower the lower income uh, white community as well. But it's going to be those first two groups first. And yes, you're right; they don't care. They don't care at all because they're like, who cares? They'll vote for us. They'll vote for us. We'll just, well, you know, if they lose their jobs, they'll go on government assistance, and it'll, it'll be fine. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, something I, I never I watched. I think all of your all of your Facebook videos. Uh, what I don't think I ever saw you address was uh, when uh, Donald Trump was first elected, and you had all those riots. And then you had the uh, Berkeley riots when, when Milo Yiannopoulos tried to talk at Berkeley, and you mm -hmm. had the screaming at the sky demonstrations. Uh, uh, did those register with you at all? Yeah, uh, completely. I, okay. I mean, I was. Yeah, I mean, I, I. I'm happy to report that I never screamed at the sky or took time off. <laughs> well, that's <for> that. good. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't one of those, but. Uh, but I do have videos, and I'll never take them down. I do have videos on my Facebook page of me crying. <laughs> Uh, after the election, and uh, yeah, all of that stuff resonated with me. I mean, I attended the first women, women's march. Uh, I thought it was awesome when a lot of them got up there and said really uh, now pretty despicable things. Yeah, um, I'm sure I thought it was uh, understandable and commendable that they wouldn't allow pro-life women to attend the women's march. Mm -hmm. Um. And yes, I, I definitely attended several of the anti-Trump rallies. But I mean, I was I was really, you know, I, I was completely delusional. And I mean, I was one of those who was like, I mean, I was one of those who actually believed. Do you remember when the whole thing was, <laughs> they were trying to convince the Electoral College to change their vote to Hillary Clinton? Do you remember oh, that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was one of those. Civil like, like, War. Yeah, I signed the petition, and I, and I was like, up until the last moment, I was like, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. I know. I just know they're going to go in there, and they're going to cast their vote for Hillary Clinton. Like, I just completely deranged and delusional. But yeah, absolutely, all of that resonates with me. Well, that is that is uh, the very sinister subtext of what's been going on for the last year and a half, is that they've been trying to uh, uh, delegitimize a democratically elected president, whether it's it's through these uh, unsubstantiated kind of gauzy accusations that uh, that Russia somehow got him elected or, or saying that he lost the popular vote, which he did lose the popular vote, but you can't, you can't change the rules after you've already lost the game. Exactly. Uh, there is something uh, very uh, sinister about trying to delegitimize a, a democratically elected president, and it's like, well, they're, they're really trying to cast us <laughs> into, like, civil war or something. It's really bad. And I'll tell you, you know, one thing I've discovered about conservatives are they're very strong. Uh, you know, and, and if you talk to most of them, even the ones who don't like to engage in confrontation and they don't like to kind of get involved in that. But, you know, if you really talk to them, they'll be the first to tell you, look, if things are really going to go down, we're prepared to fight. Like, we're ready to go. And I like I love that about them. But, you know, the adults right now who are living in this time. I'm not that concerned about them. It, you know, these, this is an ugly time in America. We're very divided. It's, you know, and we're divided for reasons that are stupid and not even real. They're just, you know, fake media narratives. But what I'm really concerned about more than anything, I think, are, you know, kids that are coming up in the educational system right now. I mean, we've all seen the stories about, you know, I'm gonna use the word proposed because I'm not 100% certain if this was something that was actually approved. But these, um, textbooks, you know, these, I'm going to use the word proposed, textbooks, I don't know if you saw this, where they talk about this, this chapter in history, and they describe Donald Trump, and I, I mean, they, they literally yeah. say, talk about him being a racist, and they talk about, like, his followers, you know, that, that, that being appealing to his followers, that he, you know, he, he had this sort of, like, racist thing to him, and that people followed him because of that, and they talk about, like, you know, they sell the same media selling points about the inflammatory things that he said, which of course he didn't really say. And I think to myself, well, oh my God, I mean, any little kid that reads that yeah. is, is going to, you know, become an adult one day and, and, and be like, what were these people thinking, you know, electing that horribly racist, bigoted man? They, they elected Hitler. You know, I mean, it's, it's a complete rewriting of history uh, or, the, or the, the present as we are right now. That's what concerns me. I mean, it's going to take us generations already, I think, to undo the brainwashing that's already happened right now. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I mean, I think it could be the case that 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 the generation that's coming up. I'm not even talking. I'm not even talking about like kids who are like who are like uh, uh, you know eighteen or nineteen. I'm still talking about like eight eight you know eighth graders at this point. Just might be so savvy 
just might be all so wise to it that uh, uh, they might blow the whole thing open. I, See, also think I hope so. Peer I pressure is, you know, that's a rough thing, though. I also think uh, uh, there is a certain uh, Pollyannaism on, on the part of the older generations who, who, who may not want to believe it's as bad as it is and may still fondly remember that, that uh, uh, Democratic Party of the JFK era. And, and they don't want to believe that it's just at this point just this inhuman machine that yes. wants to wants to uh, perpetuate itself basically. And well, it's a miserable job, yeah. Well, the walk away campaign is you know it's I think it's kind of blowing the lid off of that theory. I mean, we're seeing. I mean, I'm getting members at this point by the thousands per day. Yeah, and. Um, I mean, it, it's just remarkable. It's incredible. And it, people of all ages, people of all races, people of all 67 genders, uh, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> people of um, all sexualities. Uh, one of my very favorite videos that uh, is on there right now, um, a guy named John, and he does his whole video in drag. And I think it's just incredible. And it's like, it's amazing because, you know, there's hundreds of comments and likes and shares because people don't care. They yeah. do not care, you know? And, and this is the whole thing that the people on the left are missing entirely. It's like, they're just, it, it's almost embarrassing at this point. They're just, they're so stuck in like a time that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it's bad enough that they were stuck 10 years ago, but I mean, it's like, they're actually, it's like Benjamin Button. They're actually, like, they literally think it's 1935, yeah. you know? And, you know, so it's like, uh, what's happening right now with the walkway movement, I think is really kind of blowing the lid off of, of that, that whole thing about, you know, the older generations, because people are sick of it. They're sick of it. They're totally fed up. And, you know, I think there were a lot of people and I include myself in this group who, as the culture was changing and the culture was shifting and, you know, people were more and more embracing the identity politics and they were embracing that the, the, the division and that sort of like, you know, cultural Marxism that comes along with the PC culture and identity politics, it happens sort of slowly and incrementally. You almost, if you're blinking, you could miss it. You know, it's like one day people are talking. Like the Democrats have put all their chips onto identity politics, basically. For sure. Oh my God, for sure. Which again, it just goes to show, you know, how completely out of touch they are, that they're not getting that people are really, really sick of this. Yeah. And, 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 and people aren't sick of it because they're racist and they're not sick of it because they're homo homophobic. They're sick of it because it doesn't make sense. It does not make any sense. I mean, one of the best examples, I, I, well, I mean, it comes to the top of my head because this is when I was still a liberal and this was, you know, there were, I call it, the word I use is rumblings. There were, there were rumblings for years of things inside of me where I was becoming uncomfortable. I was like, yes. things, if things would happen, I'd be like, that doesn't really make sense to me. I didn't understand why it didn't make sense. I just knew I was like, God, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't, and one of them was in 2015, you know, there was a, the Syrian refugee crisis and we were having discussions in this country, Obama was the president, and we were having discussions in this country about what we should do in regards to Syrian refugees. And I was hearing a lot of people on the right asking these questions that seemed like very reasonable questions to me. I mean, they were just things like, how do we know, you know, because it, it all felt very rushed, you know, and it all felt very like, oh, we need to do this, we need to do this now, we need to open the gates and just let these people in, and we need to- Make, make a very impulsive decision that will have permanent permanent consequences. Yeah. The, that's a, exactly, that's a perfect way to say it. Impulsive decision with permanent consequences. And I hear people on the right saying, well, wait a minute, like, what what is the vetting process exactly in this, this specific scenario? Like, you know, what do we really know about, you know, their ideology? What do we know, you know, are they, are they, uh, you know, are they assimilated? Are they going to be assimilated? Like, do they, how do they feel about our customs and cultures? And what is, you know, it's dangerous. I mean, it's, it's foolish to think that, you know, this is just, that these just happen to be people who are a little bit darker than we are, but they're just exactly like us. You know, they just like, they just want to hang out at Starbucks and have coffee and, you know, be like, no, we love gay people. You know, it's like, that's a bit yeah. of a, just like everyone who crosses the border from Mexico is just dreaming of a better life, you know. 
Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a fantasy. And I mean, at the very least, we should be able to ask these questions and have this conversation. Well, I so I hear people on the right asking these very reasonable questions. And people on the left, I mean, immediately, you're racist, you're racist, you're racist. You know, and, and that's, a, it's becoming less scary every day, I think. But, you know, it's like, that's a scary accusation because accusations like that can destroy your reputation and they can destroy your business and they can, they can destroy your standing in your community and stuff. People don't want to be labeled a racist or a bigot. And people on the left know that and they use that as a weapon. They weaponize it, you know? So it's like, that's, I, and I saw that happening and I remember I was so uncomfortable with it because I remember thinking, these are really reasonable questions that these people are asking. I mean, this is, and even if they're wrong, you know, even if, you know, if they ask the question, you know, like, do we know what their ideology is? Do we know what the vetting process is? I mean, if you're able to say, yeah, we have a very thorough system in place to make sure that these people are properly vetted, to make sure, but we weren't even having that conversation. It was just, you're a bigot, you're a racist, you're xenophobic, you know, stuff. And I was like, wow, this is really weird that people have to be afraid to ask questions about their own safety, you know? I mean, it's like, if you use, if you use a smaller everyday example, I mean, can you imagine if you were visiting a city that you had never been to before and you didn't know the city well, you didn't know the geography and the layout and the neighborhoods and whatnot, and it was late at night and you found yourself entering into an area that was really dark, you know, and it didn't have any lights and you, and there aren't a lot of people around and you start thinking to yourself, am I safe? Like, I, I don't know if I should be here. I don't really know. I don't, I, I don't know, you know? And it's like, can you imagine not even being able to ask somebody, Hey, am I, is that, am I safe here? Is this okay? Without somebody saying, you're a bigot. You're, you're a bigot. So you have to be afraid to even just ask questions about your own, you know, that are in the best interest of your own safety. And that's what we've, that's what PC culture has done to people. Yeah, uh, uh, it, it's basically like uh, Saul Alinsky's uh, rule of, rules of radicals is that basically always make it about the about your opponent's character. Yes, I, I mean I make no uh, uh, suppositions about about. I have noticed as a lifelong pro lifer back in in the nineties, whenever you would say anything, it's like I think the fetus is a human being. They would jump out at you and say, you just want to control women's bodies. You just want you know, women to be second-class citizens. I'm like, well, that's a non sequitur. What, whatever I want, I don't agree with those accusations, but whatever I want has nothing to do with what I just said. Right. So that doesn't prove anything about, about, about the fetus. So what I think, what I see from my perspective is that mentality has gone from just being like abortion to, to infecting uh, uh, the left as a whole. And at this point, the... the the whole uh, uh, fruit is basically rotten from, from this whole accusatory uh, mindset where you just make it about your, your enemy's uh, character. Character. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, and, and, and I mean, what a, what a cynical way to go through life. I mean, yes. what is, to, to constantly be assuming that other people are morally deficient and that you, it, it's your job and your obligation to expose that. I mean, you know what I mean? That that goes into something uh, uh, that that kind of something I've been noticing. Uh, uh, part of the reason why the the writing is kind of on the wall for the left, in my opinion. But uh, uh, you talk about it's such a horrible, cynical way of looking at things, and then you look at the people who are like, "Check your privilege." You know, you're a white person; you can't have this uh, uh, belief. You know, you're not allowed to speak if you're speaking from a position of privilege. Mm -hmm. And what you spoke, what you were speaking about when you write these things out in your head. I was taking a walk in the woods. <laughs> I think about things. I, I write, you know, write most of my videos uh, in my head when I'm taking like walks in the woods or something. And I started writing this thing on, on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and I wrote, you know, what did Martin Luther King Jr. say? Uh, he said that we, sh you know, he imagines a, a better day. When, when one day we will judge people by the content of their characters, not by the, not by the color of their skin. Right. Uh, what did Martin Luther King never say? Martin Luther King never said, white people need to hang their heads in shame. White people need <laughs> to think about what they've done. They need to feel bad. Right. That's what I constantly see from the left is that they are uh, trafficking in blame and shame and, and, and cynicism and bad feelings. There's no carrot at the end of the stick. No, there's not. What I think uh, 
they've really done to themselves is that the modern modern liberals and and the modern left uh uh you know jordan peterson talks about you know ushering in the utopia i don't think like the hardline communists i don't think they're laboring under the illusions of any utopia at this point they just want to see their their enemies they want to see capitalism christianity and the family crushed they just want to see their their ideological enemies destroyed before them and so certainly uh, since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I think it's the same thing with the liberals, is that they are unable to articulate their vision of a better tomorrow. Right. All they want to do is see their ideological enemies defeated. Right. And, and uh, that can only get you so far. Agreed. You're going to have to have a vision, and think about Donald Trump, he says, make America great again. It's looking towards the future. When do we ever hear a liberal these days looking towards the future? No, they're always obsessing about the injustices of the past. Right. Well, you, yes, and you're right about that. You know, I, I'm going to put some thought into what you just said because I do, I, I think, yeah, I want to kind of roll that around in my brain for a little while and think about it because as you were saying it, the, the first thing that came to me was that you know, and perhaps that's, I still have traces of liberalism left in my brain. I, I, sometimes like I open a door and it's like a closet and I'm like, oh, there's still some in the closet over here, you know, but like, there's part of me that I think is a little bit more hopeful than what you just described about their intentions, because I, I do think that their intentions are, are so faulty and I, I, they're not really based in, a, in anything that could be sustained or, you know, yeah, sustained for the long term. But I, I do think that in, I think that there's this part of them that feels like if they can destroy, you know, the oppression of Christianity in America, and if they can destroy the patriarchy, and if they, you know, that, that then, you know, we'll live in this utopia where, you know, people, you know, like hands across America, where every person of every color and every uh, one of the 87 genders will hold hands with each other. And we're all going to, you know, it's, they're really stuck in this fantasy that kind of like I was saying earlier, where I feel like they're not able to, to, uh, to imagine that there are people that look different than us. And, but also, really are different than us. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I really think that in their mind, you know, like it, it, things like ISIS or, you know, like radical Islam and whatnot, it's so difficult for them to even accept and talk about these subjects because in their mind, they want to believe that people who look like that just happen to be darker skinned than we are and just happen to be wearing a turban on their head. But other than that, they're exactly like us in every way. Did I lose you? Yeah, well, you were breaking up for a while there, yeah. Oh, I, am I back? Yeah. Okay. But, uh, you know, other than the fact that they look a little bit different than us, they're exactly like us in every way, and that they love to go to McDonald's and, you know, go to Starbucks and, you know, do whatever. And it's like, you know, I mean, we have to have an honest conversation about the fact that, you know, in other areas of the world, there are people who have belief systems that are very, very dark and very sinister and very dangerous. Mm -hmm. and very, very dangerous to a free culture like our own, and not only a free culture of our own, but I mean, look what we have had to go through in this country to get to where we are today in terms of, uh, of civil rights. I mean, uh, you know, women's suffrage, you know, at a time women were property, at a time women weren't allowed to vote, at a time black people were slaves, at times, you know, black people couldn't get education and, and you know, access to public spaces, you know, gay people, I mean, we, we were, dying and by the thousands and I, we weren't getting you know the help that we needed or funding you know no one really cared and then when we started to get that epidemic under control it was like you know god forbid anybody wanted us to be able to you know have protections in the workplace so i mean look how far we've come yeah. and and it's like they're not able to understand that there are people lots of people throughout the world who hate that who hate all that, that type of equality that we've done all this hard work to get to and that we cannot simply just open the gate and be like, come on in, everybody come in, you know, and, and then and, and expect 
that this is going to literally be hands across America and that all of these different people who, you know, we, we just look different, but we're all the same. It isn't true. It is true in some circumstances. I'm not, I'm certainly not saying that, you know, there aren't people that look very different than us who are, you know, that, that live in a very, you know, that believe in freedom and that believe in equality and that believe in civil rights, of course that exists, but we must acknowledge that it also doesn't exist. And, you know, and that we have to be aware of that. That's and that we have to- Oh, you can continue. No, that was it. <laughs> I was gonna say it's like the, old, uh, the old saying that uh, 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 to a liberal, uh, uh, diversity is a whole bunch of people who look different but believe the same. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, it all, <laughs> what you were saying, yeah. It kind of makes a mockery of of the uh, civil rights movements of yore because uh, the feminists and the people who were, who were going to bat, uh, uh, you know, the NAACP in, in the old days, uh, they had real objectives. They yes. were, well, women need to get the right to vote. Uh, black people, we need to end segregation. They had real goals. Nowadays, yeah, those were all Republicans, by the way. Yes. 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 Nowadays, uh, those advocacy groups are are, are 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 flailing at these phantasms like the patriarchy and uh, and and white privilege. It's like, well, how do you know if if you have something as ill defined as patriarchy? How do you know it's been defeated? Well, you don't. <laughs> You'll never know when the dragon has been slain. So instead, these people uh, in these positions get to keep their jobs. They get to be permanently necessary because you never really know when you've uh, uh, defeated the patriarchy or, or made amends for white privilege, whatever that would be in practice. So yeah, there, there, there's a whole class of people who just who just uh, uh, whose jobs depend on. on on perpetuating this victim narrative at this point. Of course, and all these patriarchy people, I mean, it's like, don't these people have fathers? Don't these people have grandfathers? Don't they have brothers? Do, have they never, like, did they just meet a man for the first time when they went to college? I, like, I don't understand. You know, because I, I hear this all the time since I've been doing my campaign, uh, the Walk Away campaign, you know, that I, 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 get, I get so many messages from people all over the world every day, which has been one of the, incredible of many, many blessings in this experience, but one of the most incredible ones is getting to hear from people. And what I'm hearing again and again is parents writing to me and saying, I've lost my kids. Mm -hmm. Like my kids went away to, to college and some of them, their children will not even speak to them anymore. I mean, yeah. literally their children have, uh, in Scientology, they call it disconnected. I mean, they have disconnected from their families. And I think to myself, you know, we see, you know, these these young girls all the time going into the workforce and then the patriarchy, the patriarchy and stuff. And it's like, didn't you have a father? I mean, didn't you have any, like, when did your view of men become so warped and so cynical? And so like, what happened? You know, are we living in the same world? Are we watching the same movie, you know? Jordan Peterson has made this point many times far better than I ever could. But you just look back, okay, you go to World War I, all these Americans go over who is dying? Young men. World War II, thousands, tens of thousands of young men were slaughtered. Vietnam, <laughs> you go through, it was always been young men who had to die in these wars. Now you're living in this, in this bucolic, tree-lined college campus, and you're going to complain about the patriarchy? Right. No. Well, and that's why I'm so glad too that my boyfriend Tucker Carlson did a month long series on uh, the uh, the what, what did he call it? Uh, well, essentially, it was a it was a month long series of crisis the crisis of on men the the crisis of men in America, and each week he did an, a different episode exposing because God knows the mainstream media would never ever do a series on. The, you know what men go through in, in our culture and it was very eye-opening i mean the the suicide rate for men particularly white men is i think more than double that of any other class of people it's, it's astronomical the depression rate is enormous the, we have a huge opioid crisis in this country right now and this all stems back to depression and, and that a lot of that depression stems from joblessness and a lot of that all stems from this culture that's constantly telling people that they don't deserve anything that they ever work for or achieve because of the color of their skin or because of their gender. I mean, we're in this time now where people are intentionally not trying to employ 
white people. They're not trying to employ men. They're, you know, and they're doing this under this, this disingenuous term of diversity. But what this really is, is they're, you know, they're segregating a sect of society and they're trying to punish them. And, and, and the results of that punishment are devastating as, you know, that series that I was just talking about on Tucker exposed. Um, so yeah, I mean, this privileged patriarchy has resulted in an astronomical suicide rate, an astronomical uh, depression rate, and a, an astronomical drug addiction rate among men, and many of them white men. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, they're 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 so dismissive. I mean, I mean, and oh yeah, they don't care. They would never <laughs> care about that. I, I don't know if you've ever seen like the little uh, screen captures of Facebook where a guy says, "Yeah, I was I was born in a trailer park. I had no money. I had to." you know, work three jobs to get through college. And then, you know, I, I rose to the top of my field. And then they say, oh, you just did that because you're white. You know, you just have white privilege. Right. So uh, if you're white, you can't accomplish anything. You you have been stripped of your ability to accomplish anything. It's just because you're white. It was right. Uh, right. just locked in. Well, you that. certainly don't deserve it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, I, 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 uh, I like like walk away because you you don't make it too specific where exactly you're walking from. Right. Because you walking to. It's very clear where I'm walking from. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but but you're saying for for the people who use the hashtag, uh, it, it's open. It, basically, anyone is open to using the hashtag walk away because oh, we, we all sure. we all have our own journeys. Now yeah. I'll, I'll I'll tell you this. Uh, I throughout the campaign, uh, I was more of a Rubio guy to be honest. And so and so when uh, when Trump won, I was over the moon that not Hillary <laughs> was elected. Right. Okay. So Trump was basically a a a, a cipher for not Hillary, but uh, it things started adding up for me too. So I I had my own walk. It was more of a mosey, but it was still you know a walk. <laughs> but, uh, you had like, a mosey away. Okay. Yeah, a mosey away. Okay. But, uh, I, I'm going to make some statements here, and I think uh, you will relate to all of them. Uh, I am not, nor have ever been a member of the NRA. Uh, right. I've never held a gun. I've never fired a gun. I think I think like my parents had some old like 1800s you know bolt action thingy in the, in the shed. I think that's the closest I ever came. Okay. But I was outraged by the by the insult to my intelligence that was the aftermath of the Parkland shooting. Yes. And that that for me was where I really started getting angry. Mm -hmm. Where you know, I was doing my deflating atheism thing and then the things that made me angry started getting political. Yes. Because I was I was just so insulted by everything by the insult to our intelligence. Yeah, these 18-year-old kids, they they organize this walkout, you know, they're PR and television with their talking points and very very uh, uh you know robotically parrot these talking points the day after they watch their own classmates die i know they're chartering these buses to washington dc oh aren't they so are they so yeah. are they so heroic it's like how effing stupid are you yeah i know i know but you know it's that once again was just another form of identity politics because they the left knows that is not socially acceptable to attack a victim and it's not such socially acceptable to attack a teenager. So you have a teenager. The fact that David Hogg was a teenager was the exclusive reason he was being put on TV. So they can yeah. put him on TV for that reason, but we can't criticize him for that reason. Exactly, that's exactly right. So it's like, he can then go on TV or any media, and by the way, I mean, it was like open door policy. That, I mean, that, that kid was on TV every day, like 30 times a day. And um, he could go on whenever he wanted. He could say whatever he wanted. And if you criticized him, once again, it's just like the uh, the Syrian refugee thing. If you criticize him, it's because you're a monster. Yeah. So I mean, it's like what a perfect what a perfect uh, uh, racket, you know, where it's like he gets to go on. They, I, you know, I'm sure people get really upset with me for saying this, but they people gave him talking points. He was coached, mm -hmm. and you know, he would go out and he would say what he was supposed to say, in addition, I think, to many, many things that he truly felt and many things that he had come up with originally completely on his own. Yeah. But, you know, I anybody- I his sincerity, but I, <laughs> I think it's completely manufactured. Oh, I, I'm, I doubt his sincerity a little bit. I do. I mean, I, I do. 
there, you know, the, this was, I think he was enjoying the yeah. spotlight a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that he was enjoying the applause a lot. And, but, you know, at the end of the day, I, I do think that what, there was a lot of sincerity in the words that were coming out of his mouth. And I also think that people got in his ear and said, don't forget to say this and don't forget to say this and don't forget to say this. And it was such a wonderful, he was a wonderful vehicle for that because anybody who objected was a monster then. Yes. Uh, you may not really be aware of the full consequences for this since you don't really like do the whole YouTube thing, but you know that, that footage of, uh, of, uh, of David Hogg rehearsing his lines and he keeps yes. like, going over the lines over and over. Mm -hmm. That has been expunged from the internet, basically. Really? Uh, anyone uh, on YouTube who had that clip, uh, well, not everyone, but a whole lot of people who had that clip on their channel, they had their channels deleted. And yes. some people made their livelihoods from YouTube. Yeah. And uh, you ever see the uh, the footage of uh, of the Parkland kids backstage at Ellen DeGeneres? Yes, and I sure have. Yes. Yeah. Partying, dancing, yeah, selfies, yeah, I saw it. Try, try to find that clip on the internet these days. It's uh, all right, I will. It's been expunged. All so right. The uh, Silicon Valley companies are, 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 are complicit in all of this. Yeah. And it's all really, really sinister. Yes. Um, you know what? This is something that I think is so interesting, too, because we talk a lot about, you know, the identity politics and, and whatnot. Have you ever done a Google search for like uh, American inventors or <laughs> uh, have you ever done that? I've, I've seen people do that. I've seen people do that. Yeah. You and know what? Let's just, like, it's like let's, just leave it there. let's just let's just leave it there. Just anybody watching this, when you're done watching, just Google American inventors and see what you see. <laughs> and draw from draw whatever conclusion that you'd like to draw from it. <laughs> Yes. Well, Silicon Valley is is its whole topic of conversation. We we don't want to be going on for four hours here. Right. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I mean, it just it just seems very very strange. It's why why are these uh, nerds these I you know when I was like when I was growing up it was understood that that you know the nerdy uh, coders and stuff on 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 Usenet and so that they were libertarians. Uh, when did that change? I don't know. I think maybe George Soros is giving them some money and then they're basically on, on the hook for him. I, I, I don't know. Well, again, though, I really do think that it was just sort of that incremental shift. And what I'm doing right now, which is pushing back hard against that, um, most people don't want to do that. You know, so it's like it, for a lot of people, it's easier. And, and listen, this is there was a time when I considered after I had my red pill moment um, or red pill journey, I really should say uh, that I considered just faking it. Honest to God, I was just like, I had discovered all this stuff. I knew that liberalism didn't make any sense. I, I had had the lid blown off of PC culture and uh, identity politics and all of that for me. And I started to understand that conservatism was just logically a, a much, much better route. But I thought to myself, I'm just gonna keep that to myself and just pretend like I'm still a liberal because my life is gonna be so hard now if I start pushing back or arguing back against people. But ultimately I decided, you know, I can't live that way. That's just not who yeah. I am. And, you know, so that's why I am doing what I'm doing. Well, there's, I don't, I don't know if it's like Jonathan Haidt or something, he talks about like preference falsification is that when you have a whole group of people who feel socially pressured into denying uh, what they feel. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, cracks start ap appearing in that, it all falls at once. Like, what was it like to be in the USSR in 1987? Everyone knows it's not working, but nobody will say. It. Right. You know? And then one day, whoop, it just all collapses at once. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's literally, yeah, it's just, you know, it goes, like, we learned this when we were kids, you know, the emperor's new clothes. Yeah. Like, that, that's what this was supposed to be teaching us when we all read that when we were five. Uh, but, you know, for a lot of us, I guess myself included, uh, it took a little while to, <laughs> to learn that, to, to learn the moral of that story. Yeah, yeah. I think, in my opinion, uh, I think uh, uh, <laughs> the last... The last uh, stop before Crazy Town was, was the North Korean summit. 
I, I think for those on the left who are really convinced that Trump is literally Hitler and he's the most horrible thing. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is just an, an aside. Have you ever, do you ever, have you ever read like a Vanity Fair magazine? Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Grade and Carter always had those first page editorials <laughs> where it's like, it, the whole thing would just be invective, the, uh, just an entire page of invective. Okay. Like, Trump is the most incompetent. It's like, how, well, how can you call him incompetent? Even if you don't like the guy, he's done everything he said he would do. But right. anyway, you, you just pile on these adjectives, it would go like month after month after month, just getting more and more shrill until one day he, he quit his job. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like Trump kept winning and he had to keep doubling and tripling and quadrupling down on this outrage. Yes. That he would that, you know, Trump was driving the country into the ground. Right. So that, that's that's what I see going on. So and so I think they've been given so many chances. In my opinion, uh, North Korea what was the last exit on the train before before you go out to Crazy Town. Yeah, <laughs> and I didn't see anyone to board really. I don't, you know I, I'll put some thought into that too because I I think that probably all of us can pinpoint a different moment where we say, "Oop, that right there, that's where they jumped the shark." That, that that's the moment. Now, for you, it was the North Korea. I mean, that was pretty bad. I mean, yeah. I, I guess I would have to sort of like dial back and see. Now, I will tell you this, um, because I've been posting this a lot. Uh, I talked about this in some live videos on my page. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm the unsilent minority for anybody who's viewing. We haven't really talked about that. So, um, oh, I guess it's in the title. But yeah, my, my, my Facebook page, Please, uh, please drop by and give me a like and a follow and, uh, and check out the Walk Away campaign, which you can access through my Facebook page. But on my page, The Unsilent Minority, um, I've posted and done videos a lot, you know, talking about different subjects. And I was talking about Robert De Niro at uh, the Tony Awards. And for me, that was a moment where something shifted and I felt it. it like because we've seen celebrities behave badly so many times at awards shows or, or whatever, I mean, even, you know, what Kathy Griffin did, you know, whatever we've seen that, but th there was something about that moment where Trump or uh, when uh, De Niro came out, you know, and he just had such hubris and he kind of just, you know, said what he said into the microphone and then everyone leapt to their feet in applause. And then he kind of doubled down and he said, you know, the next thing that he said, and, I felt like this, I felt kind of sick to my stomach when I, when I saw it. And, and I had to really take a moment and think about that. And I was like, why is this, why is this affecting me the way that it is? And I realized, and I've, I said this at the time in my video, I said, the reason this affected me the way that it did is because that was not about Trump. That was about the people in the, on the right in middle America. He wasn't coming out and saying F Trump. He was saying, F you, we yeah. hate you to the people in the middle of America. And that to me was the moment where things started to shift over these last few weeks where we're now having Maxine Waters call for acts of harassment. And we're now having, uh, you know, multiple people on the left. Look at what Peter Fonda said. And, and did his movie get pulled? No. I mean, what Roseanne said wasn't great by any stretch of the imagination, but it wasn't anything even close to suggesting ripping a kid out of his mother's arms, putting him in a cage with pedophiles, yes. but, they, but they don't care. They don't care. And, you know, and, and now there's all these people on the left saying, I mean, there are articles coming out saying, you know, disconnect with your Trump supporting friends and family. Uh, people, you know, people saying, you know, harass people, tell them they're not welcome in restaurants. Maxine Waters says, you know, circle around them at the gas stations, at the restaurants, in the parking lots, whatever, harass them, intimidate them, whatever. It's gotten worse. I mean, we've definitely, it's been ratcheted up and, you know, it's extremism. And for me, I may, you know, everyone's allowed to their own opinion. I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of the world here, but I felt that shift, that moment that De Niro came out and said it. I knew it, I was like, something, is worse. Something just got worse, and it did, and it, and it's changed. And now, I legitimately am concerned uh, that we are on the brink of something very violent or something very bad happening because people are so emotionally deranged right now. As we were talking about earlier, they 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 feel so entitled to their rage. They feel so entitled to their feelings that have just gone 
completely beyond logic, completely beyond any ability to, to think rationally. And people, I think, feel justified at this point to do whatever they need to do in response to the feelings that they're having. Well, you could say that's already happened. I mean, you had the gun, uh, the guy uh, fire a gun at the Republican senators. You you had uh, the Black Lives Matter guy in Houston uh, fire at the police officers. I mean, you could say it's already come to pass. Yeah, I just, I, I just, I, I, I would love to be wrong about this, but I think that something much worse is is around the corner. Yeah, yeah, I, I just do. Well, on that. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, no. Since you were talking about movie stars, I was going to say on that note, let's close. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, no worries. We're talking about movie stars. Uh, you have you have someone uh, in Hollywood uh, uh, in your corner, don't you? I do. Yes. We're talking about Mr. James Woods. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, James Woods um, definitely gave the hashtag literally the hashtag itself walk away a huge boost um which is amazing and uh i'm super stoked about that because it's drawn more attention to the hashtag however what i want a lot of people to realize because a lot of people who just sort of exist in the twitterverse um there is a walk away campaign this is much more than a hashtag much much more than a hashtag this is actually a grassroots movement and it's a video campaign and a testimonial campaign where people are going to the, the hashtag walk away campaign group page on Facebook and people are sharing their videos and they're sharing their stories and they're sharing their stories of why they walked away from the left or why they are going to walk away from the left. But people on the right too are really finding their voices and taking back the narrative of who they are and what their core values are and telling people that they're not bigots, they're not racist, not that they, you know, that they're conservatives because they have really great values and because they love America and because they love people and, and that, you know, they're, they're not looking to judge other people or condemn other people or tell, you know, black people or gay people, whatever, that they're not welcome. This is a campaign that is bringing people together and allowing people to take the narrative away from the media, take the media, take the narrative away from the extremist left. And it gives the opportunity for people to come together in the center. The, the people on the left and the people on the right are coming together in the center. And that's where we need to be focusing right now, growing that center, as my friend Maria Albanese always says. Um, that's, where, that's where we need to be right now. And that's what this campaign is doing. So I really encourage anybody who's watching right now to please go on Facebook, check out the hashtag walk away campaign. Uh, and then please also drop by my page, The Unsilent Minority and give me a like and a follow and just check out what's going on in there because on my page, The Unsilent Minority, that's where you're gonna get all your updates about things that you can do to help grow the campaign and facilitate. Because the campaign, the Walkway campaign page is simply for testimonials, that's what it's for. But if you wanna know how you can get involved and really help grow the campaign and make it bigger and spread that message and make it better, go to The Unsilent Minority on Facebook and that's where you'll get all your information. Excellent, I think that's a kind of a great place to wrap up. You do? <laughs> well, you just explained the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> no, I agree, I agree. Well, thank you uh, so much uh, uh, for joining me, and I, I believe so much in what you're doing, and I, I'm so excited about this. And, thank uh, you. I, I wish you the best of luck. Anything else to say? No, thanks, buddy. I just want to, it's been awesome talking to you, and uh, I knew it would be, so thanks for this experience. I, it's been great. Thank you, and uh, have a good night. Okay, so I don't embarrass myself. Is there anything I need to do to click off, or do you handle that? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll handle that. I'll handle that. Bye, America. Bye, America. We Bye, world. It's worldwide. Bye, world. Yes. All right. Have a good night, America.